Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. This is our December Bible study, and so it's only appropriate that I would bring a lesson having to do with the Christmas season, the birth of our Savior. For those of you that are watching this video online, I want to encourage you, if you have not already seen the message that I delivered last Sunday, December the 1st, I want to encourage you to be sure and watch that message. That message will give you a lot of background information to the Bible study tonight. I'm not going to be going into the detail that I went into last Sunday. So I, I encourage you very much, very much, as you're watching this video, to either before you watch it or whenever you finish it, to go back and watch the message from last Sunday, December the 1st. <clears throat> because these two studies are dovetailing together. And like I say, a lot of detail was given last Sunday that will not be given tonight. I guess I'll title this The Bright and Dark Sides of Christmas. Jesus Christ is the great uniter and he's also the great divider. People of all races, ethnicities, nationalities, etc., are united in Christ. But people are also divided by Christ because Jesus is, it's pretty hard to stay neutral about Jesus. <laughs> I mean, he really makes it difficult for anybody to be neutral. Uh, for example, he said, he that is not with me is against me. Well, that's, that's pretty plain. I mean, you're, you're either with him or you're not. And there's, so there's, there's a division. And as you know, those of us who stand for Christ faithfully are going to be divided from various people, including sometimes members of our own family, friends, people that we knew, and, and so forth. So when we talk about the birth of Christ, there is two different, completely two different aspects of his birth. One is a very bright side, the other is a very dark side. I think we'll begin with the dark side because I'd rather end on the positive note tonight. So we'll, we'll start with the dark side, and we're in Matthew chapter 2. And in this chapter, relative to the dark side of Christmas, we're going to look at the chief priests and, set, and scribes, and we're going to look at Herod the king. And when I get to Herod in the second part of this, of this first section, that's where you're going to really need to go back and watch the message from last Sunday because of the detail that I went into about not just King Herod, but also the family of Herods that he produced. <clears throat> and in my column tomorrow, which will be outdated uh, in a couple days, but for those of you that are watching it tomorrow, I'm also writing a little bit about this in my column tomorrow in talking about the Herods, not that much is really said about the family of Herods, how evil and wicked they really were. They, if you remember from last Sunday, I gave you the details of how some of the Herods were so vile and bloodthirsty that they were even censured by Caesar. If you have done any study whatsoever on the Roman Caesars, they don't get much more wicked than that. 
So how evil do you have to be for a Caesar to censor a Herod? <laughs> I mean, these guys were, were just despicable, disgusting, vile people. And so, again, I go into more detail on that in, in the message last Sunday. But I just want to implore you to do that so you have that information. All right. So the dark side of Christmas, we'll start with Matthew chapter 2. And let's just read the verses first of all and then give you a couple of points relative to this verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, that would be the wise men who were who were on the way to the Christ child. He was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Isn't that amazing? The, the entire city of Jerusalem was troubled about the potential birth of the Messiah. They were troubled about it. Fearful, anxious, unsettled maybe even apprehensive and angry. Now we can kind of understand Herod's motivation. He was afraid that King Jesus would dethrone him and would supplant his power in J Jerusalem and Judea. So he had a very selfish, self-centered motive. Um, by the way, there's a lot of just, I'll just throw this in because it's fresh on my mind because I, we've been receiving so many criticisms from the Christian Zionists here lately, which I think is really a great thing because that means that they must feel that we're being very effective and we're reaching people. They wouldn't worry about us. So they're, they're doing a lot of criticism. You got, you got to understand that a lot of these Christian Zionists, they, they have too much invested financially in the doctrines of Christian Zionism to ever admit that what they are teaching is untrue. I mean, how many ministries do you know of or have heard of who in the, in the name of their organization has the word prophecy in it or prophetic or end times or rapture generation? or any of these kind of, of verbiages, which all t are, of course, nothing more than pandering to this Israel-based prophetic futurism that they have built their entire financial world around. If Chuck Baldwin and those of us who have come to see the truth about, about the biblical subject of Israel if we are right, <laughs> what are they going to do? They have all these tapes and books and DVDs and cassettes and CDs going back for years. And, you know, all, the, all this, their entire life, you know. <clears throat> and as far as they're concerned, the truth is a threat to their livelihood. I mean, this is kind of the way Herod was looking at it. Jesus was a threat to their livelihood, to his livelihood, and to the livelihoods of those that depended on, on him. But the whole city, whole city, not just the Herods, not just the royal family, not just the, the people that were dependent on the, on the throne, but the entire city troubled about the potential birth of the Messiah. <clears throat> we hear... We hear these Jews in Israel, the rabbis and so forth today that are talking about the Messiah who is coming. And they're looking for the Messiah. And of course, they got to rebuild that, that they got to rebuild Herod's, Herod's, temp, uh, Herod's temple in order to prepare the way for the Messiah. They've got to, you know, destroy the Palestinians and take over all the land of Palestine to prepare for the Messiah. And they, they talk about it constantly. You know, my, my question to these guys is, 
You know, your Messiah came 2,000 years ago, and you flat rejected him and crucified him. Now, what makes us think that you'd do anything different if all of a sudden the Messiah appeared today? This is just a, 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 a ruse to enhance their power and their authority over the people. Anyway, that was free. So they were troubled. That, that's, that's amazing. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. He wanted, he wanted to know because he knew that it was in the scripture somewhere, but he didn't know the scriptures well enough to know where he would be born, but he knew that the scribes and the Pharisees would know. And so he asked them. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art now the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, capital G, that shall rule my people Israel. Now, it's important that the prophet <clears throat> specified Bethlehem of Judea, because there was another Bethlehem, in Galilee. And so the Holy Spirit inspired the prophet to be extremely specific about the place of Jesus' birth. Not just Bethlehem, but Bethlehem of Judea. So they rightly knew this because they knew the scripture. Then Herod, when he had privily or privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. Now, he was not a baby now. You understand that? Because we'll get to that in a minute. But I, don't, I really don't mind, I don't mind the films. I don't mind the plays. I don't mind the songs that talk about the wise men coming to the manger. It's, it's fine. It's the spirit of of the story that, that is important there. But let's understand that Jesus was a, a toddler at this point. He was two years of age. And so he was not in a manger. He was in a house with Joseph and Mary. And when the wise men came, they came to a house. They didn't come to a manger. The other part of the story is, is a little bit of speculation, but uh, to me, it's the only thing that makes sense. The idea that there were only three wise men doesn't make sense to me. Never has. They say that they, they speculate three, and they say three because there were three gifts that are recorded in the scripture. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so they equate the gifts to, okay, there were three wise men, three gifts. Those wise men journeyed hundreds of miles through some of the most hostile land possible. The risks of not just weather and unforeseen circumstances, but robbers, thieves, highwaymen, uh, murderers, vagabonds. I mean, the, the risk that they were taking to travel that distance was immense. These were very wealthy, prosperous, and powerful men where they lived. They're, they're just, it just doesn't make sense to me that these three rich, powerful men would travel that distance alone. I, that just doesn't, I just can't fathom that. I believe they had a huge entourage. And we don't know, even know how many wise men there were. It, it, there might have been 30. There might have been 300. We don't know how many wise men they were. And how many support personnel would they have brought with them to protect? I mean, they're carrying gold. <laughs> you know, word is going to spread as they are traveling along this route. And people are going to start to know that there are 
you know, wise men from the east that are very wealthy and, they're, and they're, their camels are laden down and, you know, they, they, they are carrying a lot of stuff. It would have been an open invitation for any small band of thieves and robbers that would, that would want to, to take their goods if they were traveling without protection. So when they came into Jerusalem, <clears throat> We have this story here that Herod took notice of the wise men. Now, Judah, uh, Jerusalem was a, a big city for, for that time of, of history. I mean, it, it was a bustling, busy, big city. People everywhere, people coming and going. Obviously, it was the, it was the holy city for the Jewish people, and people were coming to Jerusalem constantly. Uh, they were... They, 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 Strangers were not uncommon in Jerusalem. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a melting pot of people all around that area. And it was the principal city. There wasn't another city like it for, for miles and miles. And so you think that three wise men, three men from the east, are going to be noticed by the king? I, I, they, would, they would just blend in with, with a massive crowd and nobody would pay them any attention. But if there were 300 of them, plus the entourage, or if there were 100 of them or 50 of them or whatever, and all the on that, that would come to the attention of Herod. He, he would want to know what these people were up to. And so that's why, uh, several reasons I've given you, I believe that this was a large group of Eastern men and not just three. But anyway, it's, it doesn't take anything away from the, from the story. It doesn't take anything away from the meaning of the story at all. Uh, in fact, I brought a, my copy because we've sold out of the Nativity story. We have more on order. But I'm, I'm promoting the, the Nativity story for all of you and those of you that are online. If you haven't seen this movie, it's a wonderful Christmas film, and I think you will just enjoy it immensely. And I, I wouldn't promote it if I didn't if I didn't really like it myself. And Connie and I watch this every Christmas Eve. Traditionally, it's it's something that that we do, and, and just it, it's a beautiful beautiful movie. I think the best ever uh, on the subject of of the birth of Christ. It shows the three wise men going to the manger which is inaccurate, but the, the part about Herod in the film is very good. The film captures the character of Herod and his son. It, 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 that part of it was just brilliantly done. And this, this fellow Herod is, is a major focus of this part of the story, as you can see as we read. Go and search diligently, and that's in the film, that's what he says. Go find him so we can worship him too. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to give it away. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Not baby, child. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the, what? House. House, not manger. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is the part I wish had been in the film. They didn't, they left this out. And when warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into, the, into their own country another way. <clears throat> they, it wasn't their idea to not go back to Herod, as Herod had asked them to do. God appeared to them in a dream and warned them not to go back to Herod. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, 
take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. The film shows that very well without being graphic and bloody and all of that. Uh, but it shows the slaughter of the babies of and the young children of, Jeru of excuse me, Bethlehem by Herod. <clears throat> when Herod realized they were not coming back, he, he just sent his troops into Bethlehem. And he already knew the time frame, so he knew that Jesus was around two years of age. And so he just gave his men the instructions to kill all of the babies in Bethlehem, two years old and younger in his mind, thinking, I'll get him. If I have to kill every baby in Bethlehem, I'll kill this king of the Jews. <clears throat> Joseph was warned of the angel, and they left, of course. When he rose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled by the way, you remember I told you about his son last Sunday, the son of Herod, who was on the throne after Herod passed away. And the, the, the evil and wickedness of that man was almost indescribable. Okay, so let me just keep reading that it might be fulfilled which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. So that would have been the boys and the girls, not just the boys. And in all the coasts thereof. So not just in Bethlehem, but in the surrounding areas of Bethlehem from two years old and under, according to the time when he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that was spoken by Jeremy or Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go unto the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the coast, into the land, excuse me, of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go hither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside unto the parts of Galilee. And he, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that might be fulfilled which was spoken of the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Not a Nazarite, by the way. Don't make that mistake. A Nazarene or one from Nazareth. Jesus never took a Nazarite vow. So we have the dark side of Christmas expressed in this passage. The attitude of the chief priests and scribes, as we read in verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Think about it. These were the religious leaders of Israel. These were the theologians of their day. These were the, 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 the spiritual guides of the nation. They were well versed with the Old Testament. They knew what, Je what Jesus was, who, who Jesus was, that he was Messiah. This was not a question because the, the question that Herod is asking them is where does the prophet say the Messiah is going to be born? So these scribes and, and religious leaders of Israel were not confused 
about who Jesus was. They were not talking about an imposter or a pretender. Are you, I want you to follow this. If they were talking about a pretender or an imposter, they wouldn't bother to quote the Old Testament scripture. The Old Testament prophet is not talking about an imposter. He's not talking about a, a pretender of the, you know, this person pretends to be the Messiah. No, the prophet was talking about the Messiah. He will be born in Bethlehem of Judea. So those religious leaders of Israel knew that was the Messiah that was being born. There was no mistake in their mind. And there was no mistake in Herod's mind because Herod was asking them, where is the Messiah going to be born? Where is the place? So understand that there was no confusion here in the minds of Herod, in the minds of the scribes, Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel. There was no question in their minds who was being born. It was the prophesied Messiah. These spiritual guides, these spiritual leaders of Israel, deliberately chose for the sake of Herod's approbation to participate in Herod's scheme to not only kill all of the babies in Bethlehem and surrounding towns, but to kill the Messiah himself. Do you understand that? This was a deliberate, willful, volitional decision. Now, Herod was an Edomite. And I go into details about what that meant in my message last Sunday, which is why I'm, I'm again, encourage you to, to go watch that message from December 1st. I talk about the importance of Jesus being born during the reign of Herod, because Herod was an Edomite. He was not of the tribe of Judah. And the prophets had said that Jesus, the Messiah, would not come until the scepter had been removed from the tribe of Judah. So Herod, by virtue of his, of his lineage, was the sign that it was the Messiah's time to come. So he was an Edomite, and he was an evil, wicked monster of a man. So the actions of Herod in this story, while awful and horrific, are somewhat understandable from Herod's perspective. But think about those religious leaders who claimed to be looking for the Messiah. They claimed to be desiring the Messiah. They claimed to be representative of the Messiah and his holy word, etc. These men, these men, deliberately chose to stay on the smiley side of Herod, even at the cost of the death of their Messiah. Are you getting that? I submit to you that nothing has changed in 2,000 years of human history. There are supposed Christian leaders today in our country that are willing to sacrifice virtually everything holy and everything righteous 
and everything true in order to stay on the smiley side of whoever's in the White House at the time, or whoever the power potentate might happen to be. What is the difference between them and what the priests and the scribes and did at the time of Jesus' birth? What's the difference? The, the burden on these men and the responsibility on those men to stand for their Messiah and King and the truth of God's prophets. And they surrendered all of it and participated in the grossest evil possible so they would stay on the financially profitable side of King Herod. Let me ask you, is there anything worse than that? I mean, think about all of the, the wicked sins that men commit. I don't know that there's anything worse than what these scribes and religious leaders of Israel did at this time. And I don't know that there's anything worse than what these religious leaders are doing in America today to compromise the principles of truth in God's word in order for them to stay on the financial smiley side of whoever it is that's in power at the time. It's evil. And then, of course, we have the attitude of King Herod himself. <clears throat> Verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled with all Jerusalem with him. Herod opposed Christ, and Herod resisted Christ. He summoned the wise man secretly, got the information he needed as to the location of the, of the Messiah, and then, of course, did everything he could to destroy the life of the Messiah. The attitude of Herod, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus is a perennial threat to many of the richest and most powerful people in the world. Still today, he is a threat to their power. That is why most of the richest people of the world hate Jesus Christ. It's why most of the most powerful people in the world hate him. It's why the rich men, like James said in his epistle, it's the rich men that throw you in prison because you're a Christian. It's the rich men that persecute you. It's the rich men that falsely accuse you. It's the rich men that kill you. And that's true today as much as it ever has been. The more intelligent and the more financially profitable somebody is, the more potential they have for wrongdoing and for the influence of evil in the world. I mean, you think about the individual people out here, individuals who do terrible things, and, and you know, people get all exercised about that. You know, they talk about, and, and I'm not trying to minimize that at all, but you, you, you take, you take these, you take these lone gunmen who go into a crowded theater or school or whatever the venue might happen to be and, and shoot people and, and kill several innocent people. That's horrible. It's awful. It's horrific. But it's a cakewalk 
compared to what the people do who have their finger on the airplanes that deliver bombs and missiles and drones and rain down death and destruction, not upon 10 or 20 people, but upon hundreds and thousands of people at one time. The destructive force of evil men in power is greater than all of the Al Capones and all the John Dillagers of the world put together. And that's what we have with Herod. Who else in Herod's generation could have done to the babies in Bethlehem and surrounding areas what Herod did? Nobody else would have that ability. Nobody else would have that power and that authority. To how many of them were there? We don't even know, but it would have been hundreds at a minimum. At a minimum, it would have been hundreds. And that one evil, wicked man, because of his position of power, inflicted more death and destruction than all of the highwaymen and robbers at the time could have ever inflicted. Are you getting this? It's really important that we come to understand this. So that's the dark side of Christmas. Now let's talk about the bright side. We're still in Matthew chapter 2. Look at verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, and I talked about that Sunday, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. The attitude of the wise men. Number one, they wanted Christ. In verse 2, where is he? Where is he? Think about all the excuses that Christians, so-called, make as to why they don't need to seek his will or his direction in their life. Well, you know, it's cold outside. Oh, yeah, you know, well, you know, it's just, I don't feel good. You know, oh, I got kinfolk coming in. You know, I mean, they can make up a thousand excuses as to why they shouldn't do whatever it is that God would have them to do. These wise men traveled hundreds of miles in a laborious, difficult journey probably on camelback, to seek him and to find him. Wherever God, wherever God wants us to be in his will, that's where we're going to find the Lord Jesus in our lives. How important is it to us to seek him. How important is it to want him? How important is it to us to want his will to be done, his power in our lives, his protection and all these things that God wants to do for us in the service of Christ and the will of God? How important is that? What? Well, the importance of it will be determined by what we allow to keep us from it. What we allow to keep us from it will test our value or what we perceive to be the value of that will of God in, in Christ for our lives. They wanted him. Then, of course, verse 11, they fell down and worshipped him. So not only did they want Christ and were willing to put themselves at great hardship in order to find Christ. But they also worshipped him once they found him. They fell down and worshipped him. And of course, when they worshipped the Lord, what did they do? They opened their treasures 
and they presented gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. If we are not opening our treasures, our financial treasures, to Christ, we are not worshiping Christ, no matter how we talk about it. Where your treasure is, Jesus said, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is not worshiping Christ, your heart is not worshiping Christ. They worshiped him, and they opened their treasures and gave to him as their, as their savior. Now these were not Israelites. These were not the children of Israel. These were Arabs from the east. Foreign nations, foreign, foreign regions who risked everything to come to Christ. And think about it. The children of Israel in Israel not only did they, were they not interested in finding him and worshiping him, but they did everything they could to help Herod try to kill him. Think about that. I really believe, I really, I'm really coming more and more to believe this, but I really believe it. That, and I put a perhaps in here because nobody can know, certainly not me. Perhaps, the greatest Christians in the world today are not in the United States of America. I think generally speaking, the Christians of America are a pathetic representation of what Christians should be. They're lazy, they're critical, they're carnal, They, in my view, seem to lack so much of what we find in New Testament Christianity. I, I've been doing a lot of research and reading here recently and, and speaking to people as well regarding the, the Palestinian Christians. And the more I learn about these people, the more embarrassed I am at my own lack of Christianity. I think when we get to heaven, those of us in the spoiled American Christian tradition, who if the weather isn't perfect and everything isn't perfect, we don't show up and we don't worship and we don't serve. And I mean, we can find a thousand excuses why we shouldn't do whatever it is we're supposed to do for the Lord. And these, these Christians in Palestine are literally suffering every day for the name of Jesus Christ. The last time I was in Israel, I preached in a Baptist church in Bethlehem and a Baptist church in Jerusalem. I discovered that 99% of the Christians in each of those churches were Palestinians. 99% were Palestinians. I found them to be among the sweetest, kindest, warmest people I have ever met in my life. They do not understand why the Christians of America have forgotten them, abandoned them and are participating in the persecution against them. They don't understand it. 
And quite frankly, neither do I. Read my column tomorrow, and I quote Pastor Robert Jeffers. I did in my message last Sunday, by the way. I'll refer back to that again. I'm not going to, I don't want to miss the quote, so I won't try to quote it from memory. But the indifference the hard-hearted spirit Christians have toward the Palestinian Christians staggers the imagination. Staggers the imagination. These people are living in Nazi-like conditions. The Israeli government is treating them in the most inhumane ways you can possibly think of. The Christian population of Palestine. Let me just give an example. When the state of Israel was, uh, when it was began in um, 1948, the Christian population of Bethlehem and Nazareth, by the way, which is in Galilee, about 90 miles away, was 80%. 80% of the people of Bethlehem and Nazareth and surrounding areas in Palestine were Christians in 1948. You know what the population of Christians in those areas in Palestine is today? 12%. In 1948, when the Zionist state of Israel was born, 21 or 22% of Israel itself, what is now Israel, were Christians. You know what the Christian population of Israel is today? 2%. And yet, the Christians of America are support, supporting, voting for, sending money to the power elite in America that is the number one reason why these Christians are being persecuted and killed and depopulated in Palestine the birthplace of Christ. We sing, O little town of Bethlehem. I was, as, as we were conducting our song service last Sunday, I think I mentioned when I first got up, I lost count with five, it might have been six, references that I heard made in our fellowship to the city of Bethlehem. Between now and Christmas Day, the city of Bethlehem will be reiterated hundreds of thousands of times throughout the churches of America. Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. We preach about it. We sing about it. We talk about it. There's not a Christian anywhere that doesn't have a soft place in their heart. For Bethlehem, when I, was, when I was there, I traveled extensively throughout the region in, in different countries as well as Israel. Looking back, un, you know, I didn't understand then what I understand now. And I really kind of hate that because I had a distorted view of a lot of things that I was looking at at that time. But I can, I can still remember back at my visit to Bethlehem. And I can honestly, honestly say, I think that my time spent in Bethlehem was the most enjoyable time of the entire trip to the Middle East. The people were so warm, so friendly. And I don't mean just salesmen trying to make a buck off of you 
like was the case in Jerusalem. But sincerely warm, genuine people. And I felt a, a and I can still remember this, this is quite a few years ago. I can still remember the, the, the warm feeling that I experienced when I was in Bethlehem. There, were, there was something about it that was, just, it, it was relaxing, it was warm, it was <sighs> precious. And I didn't feel that anywhere else in the entire trip, in all the places I visited. I didn't feel that spirit that I felt in Bethlehem. It's, it's, a, it's a very special place, and rightly so. But today, the people that live in Bethlehem are for all intents and purposes slaves of the Israeli government. They can't, they're not even allowed to travel and, and to in various parts of the Holy Land at this Christmas time when they're wanting to, to go to the, to the special places surrounding the birth of Christ. They're not able to do that. Here all these Christians flock to the Holy Land during Christmas season. The pilgrims come from all over the world mostly from America, by the millions. And they travel freely. When I was there, nobody hindered our travel. We went all over Israel and into foreign countries. And there wasn't the first impediment to our travel, not one. If you're, if you're a Palestinian Christian or a Palestinian anything, you can't do that. You can't even travel a few miles without going through militarized checkpoints and all of the hard people. They're not, many of them are not able to go to work. Many of them cannot even visit their family members who live just a few miles away. They are limited to a few hours a day in the West Bank of how, of having electricity and water. The Israeli government limits their power, their electric power, to only a few hours a day. The rest of the time they don't have electricity or running water. Every little detail of their lives is totally controlled by the Israeli apartheid government. And who are the biggest sponsors and promoters of that government? The Christians, the evangelical Christians of America. They have totally lost the spirit and the meaning of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was liberated by the birth of Jesus Christ. After the tyranny of the Caesars and the Herods, Christianity flourished in Palestine. I've already given you the stat. 1948, 80% Christian. It flourished. And despite what you hear from the anti-Muslim propagandists, for the most part, I'm talking about after, after the dominion of the Herods and the Caesars, for hundreds of years following, Christians and Muslims, for the most part, not entirely obviously, but for the most part, Christians and Muslims lived peacefully side by side. For hundreds of years. Now look at Bethlehem today. Look at Nazareth today. Look at Palestine today. 
monstrous persecution by this apartheid Zionist state of Israel. And the biggest supporters of that government are evangelical Christians. God cannot bless this country when we have spiritual leaders like that. Cannot. I don't care how good the economy is. By the way, have, I don't know if you're following this or not, I'll just I'll throw this in and I'm not an economist, by any, but have you noticed how many billions of dollars the feds have pumped into the stock market Amen. over the last month or two? Yes. Multiple, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the total is at this point, but like every week, yes, it's hundreds of billions. Yes, oh, the stock market is just great. The economy is great. If the stock market is so great, if the economy is so great, why does the Federal Reserve have to throw in billions of printed dollars into the stock market to keep it propped up. Amen. If it was really as good as they say it is, you wouldn't need anything to prop it up. The free enterprise system would be propping it up. Amen. It's not that good, folks. Amen. But that's what, oh, the economy, I don't care how good the economy is. Who, the economy in Jerusalem, when Herod was on the throne, was good. The economy of Jerusalem was good at the time of Herod. That has nothing to do with the blessing of God on a country. The attitude of these wise men, they, wait, they wanted to see Christ. They worshiped Christ. And then, of course, Mary and Joseph. Here, we're, we're going to go to Luke chapter 1. One of the things that I was really watching for when I, the first time I saw the movie, The Nativity Story, was how they portrayed the angel's visit to Mary when she was conceived of the Holy Spirit. I was very, very interested to know how they would portray that. Because most movies that I've seen do not portray this. And it's, it's, it is an essential part of the story. And quite frankly, if they had not have been faithful to portray this part of the story, I would never, never recommend anybody, anybody watch it. But they did. And I could overlook the three wise men at the manger but I can't overlook this. When, and, and, and when, the, when the angel came to Mary, look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 38. The angel, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, verse 35. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. And here's, here's what she said that had to be there. Had to be there. Or I, I would have never, ever recommended it. And it's there. Mary said, Be it unto me according to thy word she had to say it she had to personally accept God's will for her life she had to accept she had to volunteer to be the mother of the Christ child without 
aid of a human father. In her mind, don't think that she didn't think this through. Don't think that in her mind she did not think about her reputation. How is she going to explain this to her parents, to her siblings, to her kinfolk, to her friends, to Joseph? All of that is very well done in the film. She had to say it. Be it unto me according to thy word. I will be the virgin mother of this Messiah. She surrendered to Christ and his will for her. We have to do the same thing, folks. Are you with me? I'm almost done. We have to surrender to the will of God. And we can't think about reputation. We can't think about what people will say. We can't think about the reaction. The ramifications means nothing. Whatever it is God has called us to do, we must do it without thought without hesitation on the spot Mary said be it unto me according to thy word and I'm referred to the film several times because I'm as I'm, I'm going through this story it's in my mind I'm going to refer to one they include in the film the magnificent of Mary that we find in Luke chapter 1 which I thought was, that, 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 that did it for me. <laughs> That's it. This thing is absolutely wonderful. Because this is part of the Christmas story that you don't hardly ever hear about. The Magnificat, as it's called. Mary's prayer of praise to the Lord after talking with the angel, now understanding she will be, she's been chosen by God to be the mother of the Messiah. Her cousin Elizabeth is the mother of Christ's forerunner, six months pregnant. She's got all of this now coming into her heart. The understanding is illuminated. And she breaks out in this prayer of praise. As I read this, and I'm going to end reading this, this is from, this is Mary's words. She quoted spontaneously in her prayer of praise, she quoted at least 15 Old Testament passages of Scripture. 15. Spontaneously, on the spot, 15. Old Testament passage of Scripture. She knew her Bible. She knew the Old Testament. And she breaks out in praise. Let's read it. Read with me as I read it. Verse 46 through verse 55. And we'll close. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary knew she was a sinner needing a Savior. Mary was not sinless as some religions teach. She was a sinner like the rest of us. I rejoice in God my Savior for he hath regarded the lowest state. This is beautiful. She hath regarded, by the way, this is the longest speech in the entire New Testament from Mary. Mary has very few words spoken in the New Testament, in, in the Gospels. Apparently, Mary was a quiet woman, 
only judging by the fact that we just don't have very many words quoted of her. Regardless, this is, this is the longest speech that we have from her. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. He hath opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Absolutely beautiful poetry flowing from the mouth of the mother of our Savior right after the angel announced to her that she would be the mother of our Savior. Let's stand for prayer.